Hi everyone, I'm happy to be here and we are beginning our uh, new year 2021st with a, a new uh, integrated health webinar. This webinar is, is very interesting and caught the attention of a lot of people. We are going to talk about sleep, chrononutrition and obesity. And we are happy we have today two great speakers and we have Dr. Alexandra Johnston from the University of Aberdeen. And Dr. Alexandra is, she's a PhD and also Master of Science Registered Nutritionist. She is grant holder for Medical Research Council grant of the United Kingdom on chrononutrition. She is also senior research fellow engaged in various national and international grants. And um, Dr. Uh, Alexandra is going to talk about um, she is going to talk about chrononutrition and energy balance, effect of meal size and composition, frequency and time eating. We also are very uh, honored. We have Dr. Abdi Tahani from University of Birmingham and uh, Dr. Uh, Tahani he is an international fellow. He is also a doctor, PhD. He is a senior lecturer in metabolic and endocrinology and obesity medicine at University of Birmingham. NHS Foundation Trust. And his speech is about sleep and obesity, interact epidemics. Uh, a very, very interesting topic. And we are also very glad we have three very renowned panelists that we will have in our discussion section. So we, we have Dr. Nashirin Fahad, and she is a medical doctor, consultant of endocrinology and obesity medicine. She is chair of IFSO MENA Integrated Health Section, and she is a program director in the Obesity Medicine Fellow at King Fahad Medicine City. Nashirin Affairs, <laughs> uh, currently working at the Obesity Endocrinology and Metabolism Center at King Fahad Medical City in Hidad, uh, KSA. We have also uh, the registered dietitian Chumani Bahashi. She is a uh, US registered dietitian with five years of experience working as head dietitian at G. BMC Jordan Hospital. Chuman is one of the first members to join the multidisciplinary team and establish the nutrition department of GBMC. She is also involved in obese education locally and internationally. We also have uh, Mahan Lakawada. Uh, she is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator. Uh, she has been working for six years in the field of clinical nutrition and she's specialized in obesity and diabetes uh, management. She is currently working as a bariatric nutritionist at, at Global Hospital, Mumbai, India. So we have people from different places in the world, so we are representing IFSO and we are very happy to be here. I would like to thank the audience for being here and I would like to uh, remind you that this integrated health section is going to be recorded and it is going to be available for you to see in the IFSO Virtual Academy uh, page and also in YouTube. Um, by the end of the two first presentations, we will have the discussion section and you can send your question typing and during the uh, webinar you can type your question and I can we can select the most uh, interesting ones or the ones that arrive and we can discuss about your question if you have it. So 
So I'm glad to be here. My name is Silvia Leite Faria. I didn't uh, present myself. I'm from Brazil. I am the vice chair of Integrated Health. If so, I'm a, I'm a nutritionist. I'm a, also a PhD and a researcher. I'm glad to be here. So, Sylvia, so will I start sharing my screen now? Is that okay? Okay. Great. Okay. So, yes, thank you, Sylvia, for the warm welcome and thank you, IFSO, for the invitation to present today. So, I'm based in Scotland and I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about what chronio nutrition uh, is and how it influences energy balance. So, my own research very much has an aim to try and improve metabolic health and reduce obesity to try and improve energy regulation and appetite control. So in today's lecture, what I want to do is explore what we mean by chrononutrition, which is simply thinking about uh, timing of eating. So chrono meaning time and nutrition in terms of what we eat. Oh, somebody else. Next slide. Somebody else got control of my screen. There we go. So, um, so once we've covered what chronio nutrition means, I want to explore with you uh, whether when you eat might be just as important as what you eat in terms of influencing energy balance. And then focusing in on meal timing and really thinking about how circadian rhythm uh, interacts with energy expenditure and appetite control with a focus on breakfast eating. So perhaps you've heard of this meme. So it's eat like a king in the morning, a prince at noon and a peasant at dinner. And this is a very old uh, saying uh, which is ascribed to Mamondi's uh, way back in 1135. So uh, breakfast eating is already an important public health message, but does it really matter how much you eat at breakfast time and indeed what you eat? So for some uh, parts of the population, of course, it is incredibly important. The time that we eat is certainly a modifiable factor that we can use to try and influence energy balance and therefore body weight. And I think it's important to highlight it's particularly important for shift workers who are often eating out of synchronisation with their normal uh, daylight patterns. So night workers are working during the night hours and sleeping during daylight hours. And we know that this de desynchronisation between uh, daylight and working and eating means that they have a poorer morbidity and mortality. So what I'm really interested in is how we can use this information about circadian rhythm and chronic nutrition for weight loss. Because dietary intervention studies suggest that calories eaten at different times of the day have different effects on energy utilisation, which can lead to differential weight loss. And this is even when given at isoenergetic amounts. So what do I mean by that? So if we have a look at this first diagram here, this is some of the work by Marta Garlay in Spain. And what she's showing here in this graph of body weight over a 21 week period is that early, liter, early eaters at the bottom end of the panel lose more weight than late eaters. And this was in 420 obese women who followed exactly the same amount of calories consumed. And this is not just the only study that shows that early eating or breakfast eating is helpful to promote weight loss. So we can think about the Israeli group here. And what I'm showing here on the left hand side of the panel is body weight. So the uh, dots uh, which are uh, in black are the, the subject groups who are overweight and obese women who consumed a big breakfast. And you can see that they 
lost more weight over a 12 week intervention compared or contrasted with the group that had a larger evening meal, which was the D group, which is dinner. It's a valid point to ask, well, Alex, what's a big breakfast? So in this particular study, it's 700 kilocalories for breakfast and 200 kilocalories for dinner. So it is indeed a, a big breakfast. So this is really interesting. So how do these um, patients lose more weight when they're eating earlier in the day contrasted to later in the day? And that's of interest to me because really, if we think of the laws of thermodynamics, what we understand is that a calorie is a calorie. It shouldn't matter what time of the day that it's consumed. But actually, there are ways that different isoenergetic diets can influence body weight through energy balance. It might be through differences in hormone levels that can influence appetite. For example, this really group there suggested that the expression ghrelin was different between the morning and evening eaters. It may be that the different time of eating influences physical activity, and I would consider this a behavioural response. If we think about when we have a very large meal, we've just finished our Christmas and festive eating, often when we eat a big meal, then we tend to become less active. But of course, there's circadian rhythm in the metabolism of fuels. And I'm using two terms here, which are diet induced thermogenesis or the thermic effect of food, which is elevation of energy expenditure after eating. And these might be more pronounced at certain times of the day, which is linked to the circadian rhythm. So it's important here to recognize that both nutrients, the food that we eat, and meal timing, so the clock time, can indeed affect our internal clock system, our circadian rhythm. So therefore, chrononutrition has two aspects and it's bi-directional. So nutrients and our food that we eat help regulate this clock system. And indeed, meal timing also affects the output of the clock system. And I'll show you this in a diagram here. So we know that the um, control of our, our uh, circadian a response is very much driven through the brain, the SCN, but actually there are uh, feed forward and feed back systems feeding into the brain and from the brain into different tissues. So when these become uh, misaligned, then there's potential implications in terms of negative effects on energy imbalance and metabolic disease. So um, this is perhaps more clearly shown in this uh, small cartoon and that normal behaviour in humans is that we feed when it's daylight and we fast when it's night time. And it's the daylight that gives cues into the brain to release melatonin, for example, is one of the key hormones. When we, that uh, cues become dysregulated or misaligned, then this leads to different uh, diseases like obesity, cardiovascular disease and cancer. So eating early can maybe helpful to try and improve this circadian alignment, while eating late may cause desynchrony. And it's the desynchrony between our organs, body clocks, that can help, can lead to obesity and diseases. So Perhaps this, I'll just show this in a different way. Of course, we all learn in different ways. So the, the SCN is the master clock in the brain. And remembering that each of these tissues, whether it's skeletal tissue, liver, pancreas, gut, or adipose tissue, each have their own circadian clocks. And that means that our entire digestive process, nutrient absorption, glucose and lipid metabolism, gastric emptying and appetite hormones also have a circadian effect. These can then influence food choice and food intake and influence energy expenditure components, which will then feed back into the brain and influence energy balance and metabolic health. So what we I refer to some studies looking at a uh, big breakfast. So a question that we're going to ask in the poll is, what did you eat for breakfast? And do in fact you eat for breakfast? So certainly in the UK where I am, I'm based in Scotland, 
uh, what we can see is that uh, most of the population actually have most of their calories uh, increasing across the day, whereas the largest meals in the evening time, and it's quite common to see people skip breakfast. And what is breakfast? So for different people, it might be just a cup of coffee in the morning, or it might be a croissant or some cereal or some yogurt. And James Betts has defined this as the first meal of the day that breaks the fast after the longest period of sleep and consumed within two to three hours of waking. So we can look to association studies, which shows that skipping breakfast means that uh, you have a, a significantly increased, 55% higher risk of being overweight or obese. And a higher percentage energy intake at breakfast is in fact associated with a lower weight gain. But please recognise that because these are association studies, breakfast eaters may also engage in other healthful behaviours. For example, they might snack less, they might have a lower total fat intake, and there might be people who regular exercise. So the type of breakfast is probably important, as well as actually consuming breakfast during this period. So there are some theories how breakfast can possibly affect body weight. So here's some here. Uh, it's proposed that breakfast can increase metabolism. So um, I want to say here that breakfast does not kickstart your metabolism. That your metabolism is like an engine in the human body that is continual and that, that it will just increase in response to eating no matter what time of the day. So this occurs during all meals. There is a question mark whether diet-induced thermogenesis or elevation of metabolism might be higher in the morning. Also, just to reinforce that breakfast skipping will not cause a reduction in your resting metabolic rate, but certainly continue fasting would. So the other theme that is commonly reported um, if, you, if you use Google or if you look into some papers in PubMed is that breakfast skipping reduces physical activity. And I would actually agree with this, that there is some evidence to support this. So eating more of your total energy intake at breakfast time is linked to a lower body mass index and eating more in the evening is linked to a higher body mass index. So this is some work uh, published by my colleague James Betts in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition 2014. Mm. And what it shows is that there's a group of volunteers who are given breakfast or a group of volunteers who are fasting. And in the left hand side of the panel, this is their actual macronutrient intake, and which is their energy intake. On the right hand side of the panel is their energy expenditure. And we can see that there's a difference in physical activity thermogenesis. So the subject group that were fasting had a much lower uh, physical activity level compared to those that had breakfast. So it's really interesting that the breakfast group were able to, um, with 700 kilocalories consumed before 11 o'clock in the morning, had higher levels of morning physical activity than those that skipped breakfast. So in obese adults, daily breakfast leads to a greater physical activity during the morning and fasting results only results in par partial dietary compensation. There was no differences between the groups in overall body weight change. And certainly the most interesting component in terms of metabolic health was the um, change in insulin sensitivity. I don't have much time to go into that today, but that, I think that's an area for future research. So some of my own work is looking at big breakfast, so the big breakfast study, thinking about what we should be eating for breakfast. And what I've been doing is having a look at high protein and high fibre breakfasts on appetite and uh, control and body weight. And I wanted to explore some of the mechanisms. So I'm interested in the use of stable isotopes to look at gastric emptying, taking blood samples to look at peripheral release of gut hormones and measuring the thermic effect of food using a ventilated hood. So measuring gases exchange using indirect calorimetry. So the protocol is usually for me or is always uh, within subject where subjects spend a week on a standardized 
maintenance diet and then receive a crossover design where they get high protein, HP, or high fiber, which is HF, as a crossover design for four weeks with all food provided uh, by the uh, dietitians here in a within subject design. So what does a high protein diet for breakfast look like? So here's a photo taken in our lab. So it does include quite a, a large amount of red meat and white meat. What does a high fiber look breakfast look like there? So we've got um, beans, we've got toast, we've got cereal and fruit. So the high fiber was at least 30 grams a day and um, the high protein was 30% of protein from energy. Both these meals provide 45% of calories at breakfast, and then a smaller amount of lunch, 35, and 20% of the evening meal. And it was fed to individual requirements. So they're isocaloric, just different composition. And we can use stable isotopes to measure a four compartment model of body composition, subjective ratings of appetite, collect fecal samples to look at gut microbiota, use stable isotopes like C13, octanoic acid for measuring gastric emptying. So what type of subjects participate in Scotland in these types of studies? Well, these were for uh, generally overweight subjects that were motivated to take part in a diet trial who were uh, BMI between 26 and 41. Uh, with increased adiposity at 34% body fat measured on the BOD pod. So what we can see is, remember, the diets were both isocaloric, is that actually um, there's no magic bullet approach here. Both groups lost a similar amount of weight relative to their starting weight, so the high fibre group in green and the high protein group in pink. So there was a similar weight change in between both diets and that's what we might expect because we, we control the diet. Interestingly, energy expenditure in terms of rest and metabolic rate, we can see that there is a change relative to weight loss. The green diet is high fibre, pink diet is high protein. Again, that means that uh, it's just they, they become smaller so their rest and metabolic rate declines uh, associated with the weight loss. The thermic effect of food is really interesting because we can see the, the measurement in the grey dotted line uh, at maintenance and we can clearly see there's a difference in the high protein diet. So the high protein is known to have a thermic effect and that is elevated with the high protein diet relative to the high fibre diet. So that's interesting that more calories are expended after eating uh, through the thermic effect of food with the high protein diet. In terms of subjectively rated appetite, again, there's no surprises here. There's a significant effect that we see high protein is significantly more satiating than high fibre. And we can see here the lower appetite score scored from a visual analogue scale uh, after consuming meals. We can see the pink is much is significantly lower than the, which is a high protein, which is lower than the high fibre, which is the green line. Um, and we can see again here when you, you, you ask about uh, hunger and fullness, we can see um, differences in the pattern in that um, subjects are less hungry on pink and more full on the pink. So subjective appetite is significantly lower and fullness was significantly higher following the high protein meal in comparison to the high fibre breakfast meal. So we see similar weight loss and similar changes in body composition because the meals were isoenergetic, similar changes in rest and metabolic rate, but we noted that the high protein breakfast had a slightly higher thermic effect of food, but this differences would not be of a magnitude to change energy balance and body weight. I haven't reported this, but there are similar improvements in blood glucose and lipids. The high protein diet had a superior suppression of appetite and we're currently finishing off analysis on looking at gut hormones, insulin release and the gut microbiome. So look forward to sharing that data soon. So um, I just want to highlight that there are some really interesting work going on in the UK here looking at big breakfasts and small dinners and this is funded 
uh, by the study that Sylvia alluded to uh, with my colleagues, uh, funded through the Medical Research Council grant. And we've just published or submitted, pardon me, one of the papers associated with this work. So please get in touch with me if that's something that you're interested in. And if you're wanting to do some more reading, then this has been the highest downloaded paper of 2020 for the journal Neuroendocrinology. This is one that I've written, which is considering meal time, a circadian disruptor and determinant of energy balance. So that's uh, one of the free access uh, papers. That's something that you can have a look at in your own time as follow up for your CPD. So as final thoughts, really, it is, of course, the type of foods that you choose and portion sizes that have the biggest impact on your health. But if it is the case that timing of eating can be linked to body weight and health, we should be in a much better position to give dietary advice to people in terms of not what to eat, but when to eat. And of course, one message does not fit all people, but we're not really in a position to have a precision nutrition or personalised nutrition approach that's something we need to work on creating more evidence base for this. But as we understand this interaction between circadian rhythm and metabolism much better, we should be in a position to give much better targeted advice uh, on time of eating and looking forward to doing more corona nutrition in the future. So thank you for taking the time out um, to listen to me today. I'm looking forward to questions after you listen to Ab's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Johnston, for the great presentation. I learned a lot. This is a, such a great topic and great presentation, good research as you presented. And <clears throat> Now um, we're gonna uh, present a poll for the next uh, presentation, and and we are gonna present um, a poll. And the question is: Does short sleep duration affect your body weight? So please select yes or no. So most of our audience uh, answered yes, uh, short sleep duration affects our body weight. So with this answer, we will begin our second presentation with Dr. Abdi Tahani from University of Birmingham. He is going to talk about sleep and obesity, interact epidemics. I'm so excited to see this presentation. Hello everyone and thank you very much for the kind invite from the organizing committee. So I was asked to talk today about sleep duration and obesity. These are my disclosures. So in today's talk I will cover how sleep is regulated very briefly and how it is linked to metabolism the mechanisms linking sleep duration to energy homeostasis, the epidemiological studies linking sleep duration to obesity and metabolic dysfunction, the impact of sleep extension, and I will finish with a brief review about sleep and bariatric surgery, then I will summarize and conclude. So sleep is regulated by three processes, a homeostatic process, a circadian process, and an ultradian process. On the y-axis here you see sleep propensity. 
the top figure represents the homeostatic process. In the homeostatic process, uh, the homeostatic process is driven by sleep need, i.e. the longer we stay awake, the more sleepy we feel, and eventually we will reach a stage where we will just fall asleep. And when we fall asleep, we reset our sleep propensity to a lower level, and then we stay awake, and the longer we stay awake, the higher the likelihood that we will fall asleep and we will feel more sleepy. On the other hand, the circadian process is not driven by the need for sleep, is not driven by how long we've been awake before. It simply determines which times of the day we are more likely to feel, fall asleep if we decide to fall asleep. The ultradian process is related to the changes of sleep architecture during sleep. And the reason why we sleep or stay awake is due to a flip-flop switch in the brain. This is mainly driven by a hormone and a neurotransmitter called orexin, which is secreted from the lateral hypothalamus. Orexin stimulates the tuporomammillary nucleus uh, in the posterior hypothalamus, and stimulating this nucleus inhibits another nucleus in the hypothalamus called the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus, and as a result of that, we stay awake. When this VLPO nucleus gets stimulated, it blocks orexin, it blocks the TMN nucleus, and as, as a result, we fall asleep. So we, during the day, we are, can exist in either a sleep state or a wake, wake state. We do not spend much time of our 24 hours in a transition between sleep and awake. Most of our time is one of the states or the other is because of this flip-flop switch. Now, there are several links between orexin and metabolism that will be worth highlighting. Orexin stimulates appetite, so when we are awake, we feel hungry and we seek food. It's increased by sleep deprivation, so those who don't sleep long enough overnight, they feel hungry next day and they consume more. And also, during their wakefulness hours, uh, at the time when they were supposed to be asleep, they also can consume calories. Orexin is reduced by leptin, so in people with obesity who secrete a lot of leptin because of increased fat mass, they could feel sleepy because that leptin can reduce orexin levels. Orexin is increased by ghrelin, the hunger hormone, so when we are hungry, we find it difficult to fall asleep because that increases orexin level, the hunger uh, ghrelin, which drives the hunger feeling, increases orexin levels. And also orexin is increased by hypoglycemia. And, hypo and that's important because if, if, if a person has hypoglycemia, then they need to be awake and alert in order to treat their hypoglycemia. So what about the mechanisms li linking sleep to energy homeostasis and energy balance? So the next few slides are based on a meta-analysis which reviewed those mechanisms uh, recently. And we have to differentiate here between experimental studies and cross-sectional and cohort studies in real world. So in experimental studies, people are exposed to an acute sleep deprivation, whether it's partial or total sleep deprivation. This may not, re may not necessarily represent uh, the normal physiological uh, status of habitual short sleepers, i.e. people who actually have short sleep duration on daily basis forever, as far as they can remember. However, those acute sleep deprivation, partial or total sleep deprivation studies do provide us with some significant insights into the mechanisms linking sleep into, uh, and metabolism. So if you look in the cross-sectional studies, uh, and these basically examine people in the real world, we find that there is no relationship between short sleep and leptin. There seem to be some impact in experimental studies. However, the total effect is neutral. So there seem to be no big relationship between short sleep duration and leptin. On the other hand, ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone, we can see that in the cross-sectional studies, short sleep duration is associated with higher ghrelin levels. This was also the case in experimental studies, although it wasn't statistically significant in experimental studies. And overall, ghrelin levels were higher in those who have short sleep duration. However, does the higher ghrelin drives higher hunger? This, in, this is indeed the case. Whether we look at total sleep deprivation studies or partial sleep deprivation studies, sleep restriction and short sleep duration seems to be associated with increased hunger levels. Does that increased hunger level translate into increased calorie intake? Yes, it does. 
Again, this meta-analysis of the studies shows that there is probably an extra of 250 calories per day difference between short sleepers uh, 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 b b b between the time of short sleep and the and the time of normal sleep duration. What about energy expenditure, resting and total energy expenditure? Uh, and in order to summarize the literature here, basically there is no evidence to suggest that sleep restriction had any significant impact on resting or total energy expenditure. The results showed variable results with uh, a lot of vari uh, with large variability and large margins of error. So we are not able to, sh uh, to conclude anything with any confidence. And what about sleep restriction and weight change? So it's important to remember that these were experimental studies. So the studies were short duration, one to 14 days. They will not be expected to cause really much changes in weight during this short duration of time. Having said that, despite that, there is a small increase of weight of 0.34 kilogram uh, during the sleep restriction phase. And sleep restriction is also associated with reduction in insulin sensitivity and increase in insulin resistance in the studies that examine their parameter. But don't forget, this is an acute event, which is not surprising because we are, when we are acutely stressed, our cortisol goes up, our uh, sympathetic activity goes up, all of that can cause insulin resistance. And some interesting studies, five studies in the literature looked at the impact of sleep restriction on uh, brain imaging and how does it respond to food stimuli and food cues. And again, to summarize those studies, uh, people who, have, uh, who are uh, sleep restricted uh, have increased activation of the hedonic and limbic system. So all the pleasure centers in the brain get activated. And there was also reduction in the cognitive control over the food stimuli. The end result of that will be seeking more calorie dense food. All those experimental studies are great because they showed us the mechanisms, how these uh, two conditions can be linked, but are they actually linked? Does short sleep duration in reality cause or is associated with obesity or its complications? And the answer for that is yes. The Center for Disease Control said that insufficient sleep is a public health epidemic, sleep insufficiency linked to motor vehicle crashes, industrial disasters, and medical and other occupational errors. People who are short sleepers are also more likely to suffer from chronic diseases, and estimated 50 to 70 million adults in the US to have a sleep or wakefulness disorder. So this is quite common. The prevalence of short sleep duration in the US is about 35%, with, with a higher prevalence in ethnic minorities. And people who have short sleep duration, and in the US this is defined as less than seven hours per night, are more likely to have obesity and more likely to be physically inactive or be a smoker compared to those who have normal sleep duration. And in this meta-analysis of several studies, cohort studies that followed up people from one to 12 years, this is global, so including multiple ethnicities, it included more than 150 4,000 uh, participants. Most of the sleep durations was self-reported, and this is one of the major weaknesses of a lot of the research in the field of sleep duration. And they have used multiple definitions of sleep, short sleep duration, five hours, six hours, or 6.5 hours a night. But the total result shows clearly that having short sleep duration was associated with 41% increased risk of developing obesity during the follow-up period. And it's not just only about weight. Short sleep duration has been associated with multiple adverse health outcomes. So for example, short sleepers compared to sleepers who uh, have normal sleep duration uh, have been shown in this very large meta-analysis, more than 5 million people, 153 studies, to have 12% increased risk of mortality, 37% increased risk of type 2 diabetes, 17% increased risk of hypertension, 16% increased risk of cardiovascular disease, small but non-significant risk, increased risk of stroke, 26% increased risk of coronary heart disease, and 38% increased risk of obesity, and also increased risk of dyslipidemia. So it's not just obesity, but the whole obesity-related health outcomes as well. And this relationship between sleep duration and obesity is dose-dependent, i.e. the shorter the sleep duration, the higher the risk of obesity. And for 
short sleep, the pooled relative risk of obesity is 9% increased per one hour decrement of sleep duration compared to people who sleep seven to eight hours. In other words, in short sleepers, each one hour less sleep is associated with 9% increased risk of obesity. And when we try to understand where the sleep and short sleep fit into the risk factors of conditions or diseases such as type 2 diabetes, if you focus on the bottom figure, well, which is the adjusted analysis, we all know that having obesity is a major risk factor. We know having family history is a major risk factor. But then straight after those two major risk factors, the effect sizes are really in favor of that many different aspects of sleep, whether it's uh, insomnia or sleep duration or sleep apnea, have actually higher impact on the risk of type 2 diabetes compared, for example, to physical inactivity. We all know physical inactivity is important, of course, but nonetheless, this shows that sleep in terms of its effect size is actually greater than physical inactivity. Still, we focus a lot on physical inactivity as a strategy to prevent diabetes, but we talk very little about sleep. So what about changes in sleep duration? Does changing sleep have any metabolic outcome? So in this six years cohort study in which they examined people who have short sleep duration and those who have normal sleep duration, and they divided the uh, study population into three groups, the control group who had normal sleep duration throughout, the increased sleep group, which is the group who had short sleep duration at baseline and improved its sleep to normal levels by the study end, and the maintained short sleep group, i.e. those who had short sleep duration at baseline and remain short sleep duration till the study end. And on the y-axis here, you can see the change in BMI. And yes, over six years, everybody gained weight, but clearly the greatest weight gain was in those who were short sleepers and remained short sleepers, while those who actually managed to improve their sleep had less, far less weight gain than those who maintained short sleep and almost similar to the control range. And you find similar results in relation to fat mass and in relation to waist circumference. And in this study in which people were put on restricted calories diet uh, and they were asked to eat 600 calories less per day over 24 weeks, they correlated the relationship between sleep duration and sleep quality and the amount of fat loss. And what you see here in this figure is that the lower the sleep duration, the less the fat loss over the 24 weeks, the longer the sleep duration, the greater the fat loss over the 24 weeks. And if you look at sleep quality, the worse the sleep quality, the less fat mass loss. The better the sleep quality, the greater fat loss. And for each additional hour of sleep, fat loss increased by about 0.8% or 0.8 kilograms in this study. Another uh, study which also examined the impact of sleep on the outcome of calorie restriction. So it's important here to see how sleep can interfere with the outcome of uh, dieting in a way or lifestyle intervention and this study crossover study randomized control trial people were randomized into dieting with sleeping 8.5 hours or dieting with sleeping of 5.5 hours per night uh, and the calorie restriction was just modest based on 90 percent of the resting metabolic rate and what they found at the end of the study is if you uh, see here that the closed circles are the short sleep and the open circles are the normal sleep. There was no difference in weight loss in kilogram between the two groups. But when we examine changes in body composition, we see that the fat mass loss was significantly less during the short sleep period compared to the normal sleep. And the muscle mass loss was higher uh, in the short sleep compared to the normal sleep. Again, showing here that the <coughs> apologies, that the sleep restriction resulted in unfavorable changes in body composition in response to the uh, calorie restriction and dietary, dieting process. These changes were associated with hunger, increase in hunger, which probably was driven by increasing heroin. And there was also reduction in the metabolic rate, which probably was driven by reduction in the sympathetic activity in people who had short sleep duration. So based on these findings, it seems quite important to improve people's sleep. And is it actually possible to extend people's sleep? And what does sleep extension do? So in this small study, 10 overweight young adults who have habitual short sleep duration below 6.5 hours a day, 
They were asked to have their habitual sleep duration for one week. Then they were given sleep hygiene advice and they were told to increase their sleep duration to 8.5 hours a week for two weeks. And the sleep duration was recorded by actigraphy. So we knew exactly uh, how much they actually slept. And what you can see here is during their habitual normal week sleeping, they are not sleeping much, short sleep duration between five and six hours. But then when they actually started uh, using the sleep hygiene advice, their sleep duration improved and that was maintained for the rest of the study. Everybody in the study almost managed to increase their sleep duration and they managed to do that whether it's a weekend or a weekday. And they managed on average to increase the sleep duration by 1.6 hours. They felt less sleepy. They felt more vigorous. They had 4% decrease in overall appetite, 62% decrease in desire for sweet and salty food, and there was no change in their desire for fruits, vegetables, or protein nutrients. In another sleep extension study of healthy adults, 42 normal weight healthy participants who have short sleep duration defined below seven hours per night. It was free living trial, so it wasn't in the lab. And uh, people were randomized to sleep extension group or continuing the short sleep duration group. And the sleep extension was performed by advising regarding sleep hygiene. The compliance was high. The increased bed time in bed was about an hour per night. That was associated with reduced intake of free sugar and reduced intake of fat and carbohydrates in comparison to the group which did not extend its sleep. And in another randomized controlled trial of 49 patients, patients with uh, overweight or obesity, patients with overweight or obesity, they were randomized to CBT or CBT plus better sleep intervention. Again, the better sleep intervention was based on sleep hygiene. And what you see that CBT resulted in significant weight loss of about 2% by the end of, of the study over 12 weeks. But the CBT with the better sleep advice resulted in even greater weight losses, about 5% by the end of the 12 weeks. Again, highlighting the importance of sleep, although obviously we need much more studies. What about sleep and bariatric surgery, which is the final part of what does bariatric surgery do to sleep? In this small study of 45 patients with bariatric surgery, the quality of the sleep, uh, the PSQI score improved. It was lowered after bariatric surgery, uh, and that's after a follow-up of 3 to 12 months, and sleep duration improved after bariatric surgery. And if you look at the proportion of people reporting poor sleep before bariatric surgery, very bad sleep, it was 22%. This dropped to 5% after bariatric surgery, which was really similar 2% to normal control group, uh, which was uh, normal weight and gender matched. Now, some of the evidence about sleep and bariatric surgery is also re related to circadian and chronotype, not only sleep duration. So in this study in which people were uh, divided after bariatric surgery into three groups, those with poor weight loss response, primarily poor weight response, those who had good weight response, but then had a lot of weight regain and those who had good weight response and they tried to figure out or and they divided them according to what time of the main meal of the day what time the mean the main meal of the day was is it before 3 p.m or after 3 p.m and what you can see in those who had good weight loss weight loss, weight loss response uh, after bariatric surgery there there were more of them who consumed their main meal before 3 p.m compared to those who had primary uh, poor weight loss after bariatric surgery. Also, they tried. there was a, a study that examined the relationship between chronotype and weight loss after gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. And in this study, which was followed up over six years period as well, you can see that in the first 12 months, it doesn't matter which chronotype the person is, uh, there is a lot of uh, excess weight loss which is about 80% in the study. Having said that, after the first 12 months, then you can see differentiating weight loss impact. There is less weight loss in the uh, evening, uh, in the, uh, there is, uh, the excess weight loss is less in the evening chronotype compared to the morning chronotype. And in this study that looked at the, the weight changes between six and nine years after uh, bariatric surgery, so it was particularly looking at the weight regain, 
in this side here of the figure you can see that those with the poorer uh, with the better sleep quality had actually further weight loss between six and nine years after surgery while those with poor sleep quality had weight regain or weight gain six to nine years after surgery and that sleep duration was inversely related to the study in BMI both at six years and nine years so the shorter the sleep duration the heavier the patient was six and nine years after surgery so to summarize and conclude Sleep control and energy balance homeostasis are closely linked, not surprising considering both are in the hypothalamus. Short sleep duration is a risk factor for obesity and several adverse health outcomes including mortality. Sleep duration exerts its impact on obesity by affecting energy homeostasis, particularly energy intake. Sleep extension has favorable impact on appetite and weight loss, but larger and longer trials are needed. Bariatric surgery is associated with improved sleep duration and quality. Short sleep, later meal, uh, shorter sleep duration, later meals, evening chronotype, and poor sleep quality all are associated with less weight loss and greater weight regain after bariatric surgery, but the impact of sleep manipulation is unknown. Finally, I would like to thank my funders and the large team that we work with in order to generate data and obviously the studies, participants and patients and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Tahani, for the great presentation, such a great and, and important topic. Um, and now we're gonna launch um, three polls for Dr. Uh, John Stone's presentation. Three polls for it. Um, how often do you eat breakfast? Please select one of uh, these options. One to, uh, one to two days a week, uh, three to four days a week, five to six days a week, every day or never. Please audience select one. So um, most of our audience selected every day. Uh, Dr. Johnston, do you want to comment? I mean, that, that's really encouraging that um, the audience have got a really uh, good routine in eating breakfast, because I do think that from an energy balance point of view, but also um, in terms of controlling not just energostatic but hedonic eating, then it really does um, start your day in a healthy way. So that's particularly when um, you're going to be busy uh, for the rest of the day. That's great. It's a lower percentage of people what, that I would see in the UK that skip breakfast. So that's really interesting. So. Great, great. Um, I guess we have more two polls for a doctor. Um, breakfast is an important meal for obesity and metabolic health control. Select one of the uh, following options. Agree, disagree, or not sure. We will wait for your answer. Please, audience. Um, um, almost 90% agree that breakfast is an important meal for obesity and metabolic health control. Um, please, doctor, do you want to, Dr. Johnston or Dr. Tahani, do you want to comment? 
Uh, well, I think there's lots of questions coming in that that people are really interested in how what we eat and when we in, eat can influence obesity. And we didn't get much time to cover metabolic control, but that's something I think we'll pick up on in the discussion in terms of how how the insulin sensitivity is impacted on eating or not eating faster. So. Thank you. So we have one more poll. And uh, when you eat may be, in the, may be as important as what you eat. So just repeating, when you eat may be as important as what you eat. Please select, I agree, disagree, or I'm not sure. So 85% of our audience agree that when you eat may be as important as what you eat. Is that okay, Dr. Johnston? That's, uh, that's good. I mean, that's what the talk today is about, is really trying to highlight this really important role of circadian rhythms interacting with the food choices that we make. and. I would say it's quite a new science, so we have some way to go to try and um, personalise that to different individuals. And I think Ab's talk really highlights that um, you know the the interaction with when we eat and when we sleep has such a profound effect on our health. So it's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will have our uh, discussions. Uh, participation and I would like to thank you for turning on your camera and um, I would like to know from uh, Dr. Jumana if she has a question or a comment please turn on your camera no we can Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi. Great presentations, Dr. Justone and Dr. Tahrani. Um, I'd just like to ask, I'd like to start with um, my first question about um, intermittent fasting and how, you know, many people have adopted that, that new um, uh, diet technique or uh, find that people find it a, a, an effective way to lose weight. How does that relate to the science that you just presented in your presentation, Dr. Justone? So that's a really excellent question. I mean, there's a lot of interest on intermittent fasting and that can, of course, come in different forms, whether it's in the UK, it's the 5-2 diet where you fast for two days of the week and then feast or eat for five days of the week or maybe commonly the 18-6 or the 16-8 diet where there's a period of time, uh, an eating window in the day that you're allowed to eat and for the rest of the time you have to fast. So I suppose the most important point that I can make is that the best diet that you're going to, that, that works is the one that you can stick to. So there is no magic bullet. There's no magic about weight loss. So energy intake needs to be less than energy expenditure. And it's really about trying to find uh, a routine, whether it's calorie counting, whether it's fasting, whether it's um, a combination of diet and exercise to help people manage their weight, then you know that that's great. So I would say that in the long term, there's no benefit of one diet over the other. That's my own reading of the literature. I've done a lot of work on high protein diets and I'm interested in intermittent fasting. Um, intermittent fasting is also interesting for weight maintenance. We haven't really covered that today. So I think that, that a lot of people use that. You maybe use a different diet to lose the weight and then use that as a tool to keep the weight off. So. Yeah, it is really interesting. I think there'll be much more research around that topic. Interesting. Um, I'm personally um, 
again, I agree with you about um, having a sustainable diet and sustainable lifestyle. So for that, intermittent fasting is kind of um, not something I prefer to uh, to prescribe. And I just have another question for Dr. Tarani. Um, how would you translate um, the new or let's say the recent studies about the correlation between uh, chronic diseases, obesity, um, all the um, these new diseases that we have uh, related to sleep, and how do you do you feel like we can re make new recommendations to um, the public and as um, as health professionals? How do you how do you see it um, becoming you know recommended about um, sleep um, sleep hygiene? Thank you very much, Jumana, for the question. Uh, I think, uh, although I appreciate that we still need more evidence in the area, especially in the form of randomized control trial, trials and hardcore outcomes, uh, for me, taking a sleep history is a routine practice of my consultation. So whether when I see my patients with obesity or even with other endocrine conditions, I do take regularly a sleep history and I cover both sleep, sleep uh, duration, chrono, uh, circadian misalignment, and sleep apnea as well. So, and when I found that any of these is uh, disrupted or is not in the right shape, then I do advise the patient about the tools or the means to either investigate further or to correct. So I think uh, sleep duration in particular is not probably that difficult to correct from the studies we've seen, uh, and working with the patient might lead to improvement. In the more difficult cases where in insomnia is really a big factor, cognitive behavioral therapy might play a role, uh, but treatments are available. And I think we should try to help people sleep better, uh, which is very good for health in general, but also for us in weight management, we can improve the uh, weight loss as well as improvement in obesity related complications. Yes, very true. So thank you. I, I would like to know uh, to know about Dr. Nasrin Alferes, about her comments and possible questions. First of all, I want to thank uh, both uh, the speaker on, on, on really great talks. Um, I had a question, again, as a coming back from my endocrine uh, point of view um, to Dr. Johnstone. Um, it seems like hormones follow a circadian rhythm as well, and our hormones are very, very different. And I want to focus on a major hormone that we know is very related to weight, uh, which is cortisol. I'm, I'm very interested if you looked at cortisol uh, secretion and does it have to do with this, uh, you know, the chronological, uh, the timing of eating, so to speak? Does, uh, is it related to it? Is it not? And if it's not cortisol, have you looked at any other hormones? Thank you, Nasreen. Yes, that's a great question. So in the studies that we are running, um, we have looked at a variety of hormones, including GLP, ghrelin, leptin, PYY, and we haven't measured um, cortisone in these studies. Um, the marker that we tend to use is either plasma or saliva melatonin if we want to look particularly at circadian rhythm. Where I have measured cortisol is in the studies where we look at the association between stress and eating, particularly yes. in response to um, what we call eating in the absence of hunger. So it may be that there are states or traits, so whether we're looking at psychology or uh, how we feel or mood and how they can influence, particularly in response to stress. Stress affect us all in different ways. So if we'd taken another poll and I said, put up your hands if you eat more when you're stressed or put up your hands when you eat less, that would be me when you're stressed. Isn't that really interesting that the same uh, input gives a different output in terms of appetite control? And that is one of the mechanisms that I'm really interested in with regard to cortisol. So yeah, that's a great question. I probably didn't answer your question fully with regards to circadian rhythm, but that's the area that I think is most interesting in terms of appetite. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And to Dr. Tahrani, again, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, we looked at uh, back in 2013 and 14, uh, our group with Tom Wadden looked at the power up trials and uh, we looked at sleep and its effect on those individuals that were in the power up. Uh, and their weights. Uh, unfortunately, our study was uh, negative, but during our search, we were looking at optimal sleep time. And I was wondering, um, I, we found a number of studies that talked between seven to eight hours as optimal sleep time for weight maintenance. Um, I was wondering if you had any insights on optimal sleep time for our patients with obesity. Thank you, Nasreen. Nice to see you again. Uh, the the optimal sleep time in almost all the studies was defined as seven to eight hours. Having said that, I think reality is probably different. I think this will differ between different individuals. There is some interesting data from new genome-wide association studies highlighting more that some of the genes that actually cause short sleep are also associated with obesity. So sleep duration here may not actually even be a cause. It may be just simply another manifestation to the, to the, to the genotype that is resulting in obesity. So it's likely, it's still a complex area that needs unraveling. So do I ask people to reach to seven to eight hours? Uh, I think no, because I don't think I know that seven eight to eight hours is really normal for everyone. But I do ask people to extend their sleep when they are short sleepers, especially below six hours. Um, and the extension is depending on how much they can extend it. Some people can extend a lot, and some people can only extend by half an hour. Uh, so at the moment, epidemiologically, if you're going to conduct an epidemiological study, you are almost bound to use seven to eight hours as your normal sleep duration. Uh, but in reality, I think in real life, there is a variation. Very good. Very good. And uh, thank you, Dr. Nasreen Alfares. I would like to know about Dr. Lakdawala, if she has some questions or comments. So congratulations to both the speakers. I think I got to learn a lot about chrononutrition. Um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Johnston uh, from the practice point of view, like, you know, there are people I see in practice who have uh, cultivated this habit of sleeping late. So they are not somehow able to sleep on time. And that has definitely an impact on their weight. So from the food's point of view, we do try and recommend them to not eat unhealthy foods towards bedtime and we do give them certain foods which could help to uh, increase the serotonin levels and make them sleep a little so what is your opinion on that like do you generally recommend in your practice and do you feel that foods that are tryptophan rich do help to uh, get the sleep i mean that's a that's a great question i think anybody um who i speak to who finds it really difficult to eat breakfast and they say oh no Alex I couldn't possibly eat breakfast when I get up when I speak to them a little bit more then what I find out is that they actually have a, a late eating profile and that they are eating late and that they're eat they are indeed eating most of their calories in the evening period so it's perhaps not surprising then that when they're getting up in the morning then they don't feel hungry. So the eating breakfast has to be done really, it isn't just a single meal. Targeting one single meal in the day for obesity control probably isn't as effective as thinking about the entire meal, entire eating episodes in terms of snacks and evening meal. So coming back to your question about mood, sorry, sleep, um, I'm not sure there's any concrete evidence that specific foods are going to specifically alter brain chemistry the sort of neurobiology sufficiently enough to either alter sleep quantity or sweet sleep quality but maybe Ab, do you can you chip in on that do you know i mean i know that uh, the gut uh, feeds to the brain and that's incredibly important but i'm not entirely convinced that from a mood and food angle that that is that is something that we're ready to make any um statements about so i'll defer to abd okay and my question 
sorry and my question to dr abdul is um, i would really be interested to know um, about the effect of the circadian rhythm uh, disturbance on the gut microbiota like does that like how how much effect does that have on that and the nutrient absorption thereby uh, th thank you mariam and thank you alex uh, i think uh, i totally agree with you i think this is still need a lot more unraveling before we are able or we are in a position to make any more firm statements uh, about the impact on food and mood. However, we do know, for example, after bariatric surgery, that the desire for uh, carbohydrates really goes down significantly with the much higher levels of GLP-1, uh, and even in, in rodent study that is, has been shown, not just in humans. So there is some links, but I think uh, it's still early to actually make any firm statements. Uh, regarding, regarding your question, Mariam, um, this is also a new area of research, the relationship between the gut microbiome and the circadian rhythm. There seems to be some evidence to suggest that it's a bidirectional relationship, i.e. at different times of the day, there seems to be certain changes in the gut microbiome in certain parts of the gut. And also it seems that the gut microbiome might be able to affect the circadian cycle by its impact, for example, on bile salt metabolism. So this is really an expanding area we know very little about up till now, but it's getting uh, the knowledge in that field is increasing. Uh, how that effect eventually affects disease and chronic diseases remains unknown. But certainly there seems to be some bidirectional effects, uh, both the circadian cycle and the gut microbiome. Thank you so much for the answer, Doctor. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you for the discussions, for the great, great, great questions. Now we have some questions from the audience, from the floor, and also some questions received from our um, uh, secretary. And we have one question for Professor uh, Alexandra. Uh, for a person who is slightly overweight, enjoys eating sweets and wants to lose weight. Is there any best time of the day for eating some sweets? <laughs> um, so, we know that um, you are much more insulin sensitive in the morning compared to the evening. So, um, I'm not sure that sweets are an essential part of the diet. They are to be. Uh, I tend to have mine within the context of a meal, so they're added on. Uh, but certainly, I do know that if you are going to um, be thinking about the amount and type of carbohydrate or sugar, then uh, you're going to be much more effective. And that's been shown in healthy subjects and those with type 2 diabetes. Uh, to be more insulin sensitive in the morning and you're less sensitive in the evening. So that means you would get a much greater uh, area under the curve glucose response in the evening compared to the morning. So from a metabolic health point of view, um, then you, you know, it would have a less uh, dramatic effect on glucose excursion in the morning <laughs> than in the evening. So. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tahani, we have a, another question for you, Professor. Uh, I am a male, a senior citizen, and I would like to know if I get only six hours or less of sleep at night, a night, will my efforts to lose weight be affected? Thank you for the question. Possibly, yes. It's probably harder for the person who sleeps six, less than six hours a night to lose weight. Uh, they might lose weight if they try, but they probably will lose less the weight than the, what would have achieved if they were sleeping longer. And also, the weight loss may not be all from the fat. They might lose a little more from the muscle rather than the fat. So overall, I think if somebody is below six hours a night and they are dieting or following a lifestyle intervention to lose weight, they probably would be better off if they include ext sleep extension as part of their lifestyle intervention. But I appreciate the data is based on small studies at the moment. Thank you. We have a question from the floor, from the audience. Penelope asked, and I would like to know uh, Professor Johnston, uh, her uh, opinion. What do you think if your patients are not hungry in the morning? Uh, tell them that they have to eat breakfast even though they are not experiencing hunger? 
yes, that's a really good question because, of course, appetite isn't just driven by our physiology. We've talked a lot about hormones and different peripheral markers. It's our behaviour. And we eat when we're not hungry and we don't eat when we are hungry. So actually, there's a really nice study that I can I can share if the speaker wants, if the question, person who asked the question wants to email me, um, then I can send them a paper that shows that actually getting people to change their behaviour is actually an effective way of helping them lose weight. And it may not just be because of the morning versus evening, it's getting them to be more aware of what they're eating in terms of calories. So it might be more behavioural response rather than what I would call a, a genuine metabolic response. So, yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. And um, a question from uh, Mr. Hamadam. Uh, water intake in relation to meals. The relation between water intake in relation to meals. That for in me? The, yeah. Um, so water intake um, is really important just in terms of the uh, viscosity for gastric emptying and um, just maintaining hydration. I don't think that there's anything uh, anything above that. You know, if you uh, think about gastric emptying, it will be influenced by the food matrix, so beverages, or doesn't usually don't usually give as good feedback in terms of appetite control compared to solid foods. So. Yes, so that of course we must all properly hydrate. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, for Dr. Tahani, I will have a question for Eleanor Gold. Uh, what would the advice be for swift, uh, swift uh, overnight workers? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's very tough because. Uh, with shift working, obviously, you've got the circadian misalignment. They are awake uh, and assuming they are a shift work overnight for this particular example. So they are awake at the time when they are supposed to be asleep and they are feeding at the time when they are not supposed to be feeding, which is, has been shown by several studies to be associated with long-term chronic conditions. So what I would say is, at the end of the day, we, we, it probably is not the right way, it's not the right time to lo try to lose weight when you are doing shift working, but at least probably it's a time to try not to gain weight. So mindful eating and uh, eating probably smaller portions, uh, uh, trying to do that earlier before the shift and after the shift, because after the shift is the right time for us in our circadian cycle to consume calories, that's when the cortisol obviously start going up. But it is very difficult to shift working. Everything is messed up. The sympathetic activity is messed up. The uh, cortisol secretion is messed up. And the time of wake and sleeping, uh, availability of food is also messed up. I mean, I know from the hospital, when we do night shifts, there is hardly anything you can eat, which is not calorie dense. Uh, you, you can, you know, it's very difficult to find anything that can fall into the healthy category. So, so options can be very limited. So I guess people just need to be very mindful and try to minimize the negative impact. That's great. We have another question for you, Dr. Tahani, from like the same uh, same topic from Larian Batterman. Uh, when should shift workers eat their main meals? At the end of their shift, early hours, to feed in with the natural circadian rhythm, but before they they slept or they sleep or before their shift, before they start their day, but out of the uh, the synchronism with the circadian rhythm? So I, I think uh, we don't know. I don't know the answer for that. And nobody, I think, knows for sure. There are some studies ongoing. I know one study of them in case King's College in London is also ongoing, trying to address aspects of that question. Um, if the shift work is prolonged, then the circadian will shift. So for example, uh, if the person is going to be awake overnight for let's say two weeks of shift working, then actually the cortisol secretion will move. Uh, it will not be exactly at the time we would expect it to be. So, so, so that means the whole food cycle can move with it. So, you, so it depends what we mean by shift work here. Uh, one or two nights is different from having a night shift for two weeks or one week. So, so if it is prolonged, then the whole food cycle can shift with it, will be my advice. Nonetheless, a lot more studies is needed. 
and they are ongoing. I don't know if, if Alex has any more comments. Yeah, so yeah, so one of the studies that I'm running with Jonathan Johnston down in Surrey is looking at this catch up, how long it takes for the body to catch up in terms of the change and shift of the circadian rhythm. And we do really difficult studies, or he does, um, where they uh, have uh, different light controls. So there are phase advance or a phase delay. So it's a bit like jet lag, inducing jet lag. So yeah, we've got some really interesting data coming out to looking at what happens over day one to two, day three to four, five to seven. So it, which is particularly relevant to people who are changing shift patterns. So yeah, it's really interesting. And in the UK, we have no evidence for shift workers. We have the eat well plate for healthy eating for the general population. And I think it's a huge problem that we don't have any evidence-based research to give guidelines to people who work shifts. So that's a knowledge gap, definitely. And if I can just add a comment to that, um, I, you, what I tell my patients is, as Dr. Defani said, is a stick to one shift. So if you're going to do nights, do nights. And if you're going to do nights, just do them for a prolonged period of time. And we will be able to work with you and treat your obesity if we're doing that. But if you're taking two nights a week and then three, you know, three day time shifts, it's going to be much harder that, to manage your weight than just doing the nights. And then um, but it's it's just easier to do it that way. That's the advice I actually give my patients because as you said, the shifting of hormones happen and then we can actually just deal with them as uh, their night is their day and then their day is their night and, and uh, we can get them to lose weight that way. Interesting. That's great. And we have- Quick comment, I'll be really very interested to uh... Uh, apologies. Just a quick comment. I'll be very interested to see actually when that shift mode exactly happens uh, with the work that Alex mentioned. You know, when does it actually become? When does the cycle moves? And then really we can deal with their day as their not, as uh, sorry, we can deal with their night as a day. It would be very interesting to see. Yes, we have a lot of uh, interesting questions from the audience and Anna. Uh, Harry Hain asked Dr. Professor Johnston, uh, do you recommend having a higher carbohydrate ca uh, calorie meal at breakfast instead of in the evening with your type 2 diabetes patient? Does this uh, help regulate their blood glucose control? That is an excellent question and I think there's some clinical trials, randomised control trials ongoing in the UK at the moment because it's not currently part of the toolbox but I feel sure it should be. So not only what we eat but when we eat. So the composition of food that we eat at breakfast is something that is really important. For example, I know that high protein breakfast is particularly good at uh, filling you up and if you feel full and you don't feel hungry you're much more likely to stick to your calorie intake for the rest of the day so it's all about adherence uh, to um, calories so yes I, I think that that will become part of the toolbox approach in terms of different uh, what suits different people but currently it's probably it's not there yet so and we have another great question from uh, Mr. Amhat. Um, does the effect of hypoglycemia on orexin support the glucostatic theory as well with regards of dips in blood glucose increase hunger? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, the, uh, the hypoglycemia. Uh, and decrease in glucose levels, increase hunger. In fact, it's one of the difficulties when trying to convince people that insulin does not increase hunger, because most people associate insulin treatment with increased hunger, but it's not the insulin. Insulin is an appetite suppressant. What increases the hunger is the drop in the glucose. So, so yes, glucose, glucose, the, the drop, the, the reduction rate in glucose going down does increase hunger indeed and increase appetite. Great. Um... Let's see more questions. Um, from 
uh, Bernadette Kenan uh, hadn't the old uh, hadn't the old adage of eat less, move more, being proven not to work long term from those living with obesity. Does it not add to the disordered hormones just as lack of sleep can? I guess it's for Is the question to me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So, so I think I think we need to differentiate between multiple things. We need to differentiate between different degrees of obesities because uh, mild obesity is not the same as severe obesity. The amount of weight loss required is different, and also the uh, uh, easiness or the hardness of losing that weight is very different. And the tools in the box to use are very different as well. The other thing to differentiate is I certainly just telling people to try to eat less and move more does not work. In the vast, vast majority of people, it doesn't work. We know that uh, 20, 80% of people who lose 5% of their weight, they regain it after five years. Having said that, if the eat less, move more, included behavioral intervention, included strategies to treat the underlying causes of the behavior, then that's a slightly different story. And that doesn't really become eat less, move more anymore. That's really a, a genuine psychological behavioral intervention that addresses the underlying causes of the excess weight. Uh, but but people with a BMI of 27 are not the same uh, as someone who with a BMI of 45. The treatment strategies will differ hugely. Uh, but I agree. It just just simply telling people to restrict their energy intake and increase their energy expenditure doesn't work. Uh, and and there are lots of reasons why their energy intake is as it is and their energy expenditure as it is. Unless we understand the underlying drivers and address them, then we will not win. Thank you. And a question for Professor Johnston from Peter e Ehak. Uh, what about timing of eating in the uh, eating window in the intermittent fasting? Hmm. There's a couple of good studies um, from Sachin Panda's group in the US that have looked at this and the Australian group, and they've looked at um, if the eating window is in the morning compared to the evening. My interpretation of this data from at the moment is that intermittent fasting is less useful for body weight uh, or weight loss and more beneficial for impact on metabolic health and that the early feeding, so the morning feeding, morning window of eating is more beneficial for metabolic health compared to the later eating uh, uh, window. So if I was going to be doing intermittent fasting, I would be having my six or eight hours starting at breakfast time into uh, up to lunchtime rather than uh, having an extended overnight fast. I would be starting the morning with with food and then having my eating window then. And that's because, I mean, just because of the impact on glucose excursion um, and, and metabolic control. Thank you. Uh, Claire P Perkers uh, asked, a lot of my patients say that when they start eating this uh, tiger, they appetite and then eat more during the day. Uh, this is why they do not eat breakfast or eat later in the day. What would you suggest for these patients, Professor Johnson? Um, well, that's interesting because actually what we find is that people who skip breakfast tend to be overweight and it's a bit of a chicken and the egg situation here because you then feel really hungry later on in the morning and will eat almost anything because you're so hungry and it tends to be, you know, energy dense, convenience food and of probably low quality. So actually, if you get into the routine of, of thinking and planning what you're going to be eating, then uh, that, that, th this will reinforce that habit of thinking about uh, the quality and quantity of food that you're going to be eating. So um, it's apt and fair that, you know, it's not just about calories in and calories out, it's about behavioural strategies that get people to reinforce making 
positive choices every day because that's that's what it entails so yeah. it's not easy i ex i accept yeah um a question on for dr tahani uh hasn't the old adage of eat less move more been proven not to work long term for those living with obesity does it not add to the disordered hormones just as lack of sleep can from bernadette can you repeat the second half sylvia if you don't mind uh, uh, does it not add to the disordered hormones hormones just as lack of sleep can yeah okay so so it's a, that uh, dieting processes or significant weight loss due to calorie restriction uh, generate imbalance in satiety and hunger hormone that is tilted to higher ghrelin which is the higher the hunger hormone and lower peptide YY and GLP-1, which are satiety hormone, and that calorie restriction is associated with what is, what is named as metabolic adaptations, i.e. The, the resting energy expenditure drops more than what is expected just from the loss of the mass or the fat mass. Uh, and, and that's true. And, and these are, uh, some of these changes happen with the sleep restriction, but not all of them. Uh, for example, we haven't seen the impact on energy expenditure with sleep restriction. So asking people, again, just to pro eat less and move more uh, without providing the support, without providing the behavioral intervention, without providing uh, an approach of it as a chronic condition or disease where we support the people long term, uh, yes, could worsen the situation over the long run. Because the metabolic adaptations can last for years after uh, weight loss. So you might lose weight and then regain it, but actually the next wave of weight loss becomes even harder. Great, thank you. Another question for you, Dr. Tahani from Sandy Evans. Uh, what is identified as good sleep hygienicy practice? Any references? Yep, so there are some, uh, I'm happy to email references to, to people if they contact me, but you'll find information on the CDC website. You'll find the information about sleep hygiene on the American, sleep, uh, the American uh, Academy for Sleep Medicine website. Uh, and it is what most people will probably will know, but the, the same with obesity, we, we just need to re-emphasize re what is known to many people. So that means uh, don't uh, use your screens, i.e. mobile or tabs before bed. Make sure that the room is, uh, has very low light. Avoid caffeine for two hours before sleep. Have a relatively quiet place to sleep. Make sure it's comfortable uh, 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 bed space, etc. Uh, but the list is long. Uh, and as I said, this can be found on multiple websites. Okay. Um, <clears throat> for Dr. Professor Johnston, uh, regarding water intake and meal intake relationship, I heard that our feeling for hunger and thirsty could mix up. Uh, we could feel hungry, but actually we were just thirsty. Um, so we end up eating extra unneeded calories. What do you think about that from Peter Ishak? This is going to be my last question, Sylvia, because I've got another meeting, but it's a good question to end on. I think that's a bit of an urban myth. I think thirst mechanisms are highly controlled in the human body and uh, in, with regard to hydration and kidneys are very effective in queuing um, uh, when we need to hydrate. However, the same cannot be said for appetite control mechanisms. They are very ineffective cues uh, in terms of queuing when we need to eat. And actually, a lot of our cues are behavioural. So it's either the time of day, other people, um social cues environmental cues these all feed in as nutritional and non-nutritional cues that establish what we're eating so yes i would agree that often we eat when we're bored when we're stressed and less so when we're thirsty i do think the thirst mechanisms are really highly regulated appetite mechanisms are not highly reg regulated so yeah thank you Another question for you, Professor Johnston from Priska, uh, Jordan. 
And do you think our lifestyle impacts on how much and when we eat um, in the morning? Is it difficult to prepare a meal when we are rushing to work and must of us have short lunch lunch break? The only time for the day to have a proper meal, unfortunately, is in the evening. Yes, for sure. Uh, that's why often when I do these polls about eating, when you eat breakfast, some people say two days a week, which is the weekends. And often the weekend types of foods that we eat are different from weekday. Um, and yeah, it does require planning in terms of shopping, in terms of food preparation. You know, a lot of us are working from home now, so we've got the opportunity to prepare something the night before and have it ready to go. So now is your chance. <laughs> Obviously, time, restricted time, when you are busy people, then you're much more likely to grab, you know, what's on offer. Particularly in the clinical environment, often that's not, a, you know, a great offering. So, you know, if you're like me, then you're wandering around with your lunch bag and breakfast bag with you and unfortunately the truth is yes often we are eating in front of our screens and we are not eating in a sort of eating environment that is going to support appetite control but that's that's the truth of you know modern lifestyle we need to be more thoughtful and mindful about what we're eating and when we're eating so, yeah so thank you, Professor uh, Johnston. I know Professor Johnston uh, uh, has a, a, a full schedule and maybe she has to, to leave. So I will um, ask for Dr. Tahani the next questions from Elena, who is Yuker. Uh, respect to seven to eight hours of sleep and body weight, do you think it is the same effect in uh, if they are during uh, the night or it should be possible to divide them in two periods during the day? For example, six hours during the night and two in the afternoon? Uh, thank you for the, the question. This is a very interesting question. So from a sleep duration and obesity perspective, my advice would be that the seven to eight hours needs to be overnight. Uh, during the what is expected to be the sleep time. And the reason for that is that sleep itself is not a homogeneous process, i.e. there are different sleep stages, they occur at different times of the night, and if we don't get our seven or eight hours over the night, uh, then the sleep stages distribution will be different, and then the sleep quality, which I highlighted in some of the slides in my presentations, will be affected. Uh, the impact of napping during the day seems to be an interesting one. Because some studies showed that napping, napping worsen weight and worsen metabolic outcomes. Uh, and these happen, mostly happen in societies that they do not usually nap. On the other hand, there are some studies that showed that napping during the day could be actually useful metabolically. And these usually come from countries which are usually, they, they usually nap. So I don't know yet whether napping is good or bad. It might depend whether you are in Greece or in the States or the UK. Uh, or in the Middle East, I don't know. Uh, more research is needed in this area. Thank, thank you, Doctor. I, I would like to, to thank uh, Professor Johnston and say goodbye for her. Thank you for your participation. It was an um, uh, honor to participate in this section with you. Thanks. Take care, Alex. So now I would like to know um, uh, the uh, uh, take home messages from uh, Chomana. Do you have something to tell our audience, like a take home message? I actually really enjoyed uh, the talks and uh, I learned a lot actually. And a lot of the questions that were asked were things that I usually go through in my clinic, especially about eating breakfast. Uh, bariatric patients tend to dislike eating breakfast in the morning. It has something to do with their stomach, um, uh, you know, readiness to accept food. So I always struggle with counseling patients on the importance of having your meals earlier and not having like one big meal at the end of the day. Um, as far as uh, sleep duration is concerned, also I get a lot of um, uh, clients that 
you know, uh, have different lifestyles. Some of them have their seven hours of sleep um, early in the morning at dawn, for example. So um, it's really interesting to uh, note that it's not just the hours of sleep, it's also when you sleep so that you can have your circadian rhythm in, in line with, um, you know, metabolic processes and have them um, actually not dysregulated. So um, very, very informative talk and I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Dr. Tarani and Dr. Alex as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, pleasure. Dr. Alfers, National Alfers, do you have uh, something to tell us as a take home message? Uh, thank you so much for, again, uh, the speakers and the great discussion. I think the two take home messages, uh, most importantly, is not only to simplify the world, uh, the, the world lifestyle, unfortunately, has been simplified into diet and exercise only. And now we can see that it is not only that, but it is really bigger. And that's why I like to call it the micro environment of the patient. Uh, it's not only how much they eat, but really what they eat and when when, most importantly, when they eat and sleep is important. And it's not only sleep as we just mentioned sleep, but I think two things have to be added to every person that's taking a history from someone with obesity. How many hours do you sleep? And when do you sleep? Do you have any circadian rhythm disruption? I think working, working on that aspect is probably as important as working on the other aspect, which is what are you eating and uh, how many hours of exercise that you are doing. So if there's anything that we're going to take out of, of the great talks today is please make an emphasis on those important points as well. Thank you for having me as a panel today. <laughs> that was a pleasure, that was a pleasure. And, and Dr. Lakdawala, do you have a take home message for us? Yes, I do. I mean, I totally agree with Dr. Nasreen. Uh, when even I counsel, I make sure that I always include sleep as a very important lifestyle factor, which has to be taken care of. So it's not only about exercise and uh, diet, but sleep actually plays a very important role. In fact, off lately, I've been having so many adolescents, especially in the lockdown period, who are at home and they've not been sleeping because they're busy fiddling with their uh, electronic gadgets. And because of which they've actually gained so much of weight and it's so difficult to counsel them, but I realize that sleep hygiene is so important to make sure that they, you know, their day starts on time and then everything else falls in place. So I think I would really like to urge everybody to take uh, sleep as a very important counseling um, factor when you counsel the patient for weight loss. Thank you so much for having me as a panelist today. Thank you, our pleasure. I, I would like to just make one question for Dr. Tahani that I didn't hear about that. Uh, do you have anything to talk about, to tell us about the interference uh, of alcohol intake and sleep? Yeah, absolutely. So alcohol uh, can have negative impact on sleep in two, by two mechanisms. Uh, of course, on the face of it, alcohol can make people sleep longer, but that's not usually a normal sleep, unfortunately. Uh, people who drink alcohol lose a lot of their deep sleep. Uh, and they also have uh, worse, more sleep apnea. So their sleep architecture uh, is uh, more interrupted. And even if even mild amount of alcohol can actually worsen sleep apnea overnight. So I think alcohol can have very negative impact on sleep. Can I just mention one point, uh, just uh, which I, I think mentioned by Mariam? It's fascinating. We collected data during the lockdown in multiple countries, including actually in Saudi, where, where Nasreen is. And what we found that people who reported that they lost weight during lockdown were exactly the same people who said they are sleeping better during the lockdown. Now, these people probably never had the chance to sleep because of their working hours. Uh, and now they sleep better during the lockdown and they are managing to lose weight. Now, it's a cross-sectional. I appreciate I can never tell the direction of the relationship, but it's important that during, during the lockdown, those who manage to get better sleep, they seem to actually do better metabolically. And just to add Great. a comment to that, as long as you talked about the Middle East here in Ramadan, in the uh, month of Ramadan, we have the perfect storm where people are actually fasting uh, throughout the day from dusk to from uh, dawn till uh, uh, from dusk to dawn, and, and and what happens is that um, they have a shift 
in their uh, circadian rhythm. And at the same time, the heaviest meal is shifted to the night. And we do see a lot of weight gain during that month. And we really, even in our obesity medicine clinic and our diabetes clinics, try to mitigate that weight gain by trying to instruct people not to do that. Um, so it is really for, our, for people who are doing obesity or obesity specialists, we call it the month of the perfect storm because that's what happens. Indeed. Thank you. So I would like to thank all of the discussants. I'd like to thank Jumana, Dr. Nasreen, Dr. Miriam Nakdawala for your participation, for your comments. It, it, it was an honor to participate in this great uh, integrated health webinar. And I would like to congratulate Dr. Tahani and Professor Johnston for great presentations, great topics, and very important topics. And we should uh, like know more about that to take care of our patients. And I would like to thank our audience, our uh, Integrated Health member for participating in our uh, webinar. There were a lot of people um, watching our webinar. And I would like to remind people that our uh, webinar is recorded and is going to be available in the IFSO Virtual Academy page for the members and also in YouTube. If you didn't have uh, time to see the whole presentation and want to see it again because it was awesome, uh, please go there and you can watch it again. And I would like also to thank uh, the IFSO, uh, uh, Manuela and, and staff for supporting us during, during this IFSO present, uh, webinar presentation. And we are, I guess we are over. I would like to thank you all for uh, being here with us in our first webinar of 2021st. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, people. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much.